Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I want to talk about James Hansen's uh, newest um, article that just came out on his website called Global Warming Acceleration, El Nino Measuring Stick Looks Good. And just as a review, um, the warming, the best linear fit to the global warming has been 0 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. That's between 1970 and 2010. And the projection from James Hansen is that after 2010, the rise is somewhere between 50 and 100% higher than this. So 50% higher is 0 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade. That's this lower line here. Um, and 100% increase in this number would be 0 0.36 degrees Celsius per decade, which is the upper part of the line. So the accelerated warming is expected to be um, somewhere in this yellow region. Um, the El Nino is likely to peak us even above that region is what Hansen's been saying for a long time. So in this study, he actually compares the El Nino, the first six months of the previous El Nino in 2015 to 2016 with the first six months of the current El Nino and the temperature difference is 0 0.39 degrees Celsius. We're, we're that much warmer now than we were um, just a short time ago. This is consistent to a rate of 0 0.49 degrees Celsius per decade, which is huge. And it's consistent with the expectation of a large acceleration of global warming. So we're way above even, like I said, this was 0 0.27. 0 0.36 degrees Celsius per decade. This is 0 0.18, and we're actually 0 0.49 over the last, um, slightly less than, than, than a decade, right? Which is, which is huge. Like it's just an incredibly huge warming. So I'm gonna talk about this, but before I do that, I wanna show you an interesting um, graph, which Leon Simmons put out on Facebook. And this is the, the monthly total anthropogenic and international shipping sulfur dioxide SO2 emissions. And it's compared with regional and global sea surface temperature anomalies, the SSTAs. Okay, so at the very top, this is all from 1950 to now. At the very top, we have the global emissions, total global emissions of sulfur dioxide. So that's from land-based sources where it's very intense, but also from marine shipping, plying the oceans. Most of the trade and travel is in the Northern Hemisphere, as you can see. And what you can see is this is the sulfur dioxide emissions. Um, there's some variation in spiking, um, and then it's dropped, it started dropping after the 1990s, as the air pollution regulations took off and there was less sulfur in from industry and in shipping fuels. Um, and then it's, it, it, it's basically been trending down since then. After 2020, there's a big spike downwards um, because of the International Maritime Organization tightening emissions. They did it about here. They also did it here. There's also emission, less emissions from China. So the sulfur dioxide has been dropping. And this is a problem for aerosols because there's less aerosols in the atmosphere. So there's less of this global dimming effect. There's more sunlight uh, hitting the earth. So the solar intensity is stronger and the solar absorption is stronger and the oceans are warming like crazy as well as the rest of the planet spiking up. This is the global shipping emissions component. Okay, so you can see um, just the shipping components are compared. This map has shifted. South America is here as opposed to here, but you can see in the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, the emissions are very, very high. And you can see that the shipping emissions have actually uh, been increasing while the total emissions have been dropping. So the emissions over land have dropped faster than the shipping has increased. But then, you know, around 2010, there was a sharp drop. 
you know, there, there's more drops in, in the years ahead. But then look at the drop here. It's fallen off a cliff. Okay, the tightening of the um, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, tightening the removal, essentially, of sulfur um, by an order of magnitude from shipping fuels has caused a huge drop in the shipping component. And you can see it reflected in the overall global component which is comprised of all the emissions from land as well of sulfur dioxide. So global dimming is being greatly cut. And the biggest effect is not the direct effect of the aerosols blocking sunlight, but it's the indirect effect of the aerosols on, on, on the nature of low level cl clouds, especially over the ocean. Now over the land, there's always lots of um, aerosols and other particles that act as cloud condensation nuclei. But over the pristine oceans, there's a lack of particles causing the, you know, that, that aid in cloud formation. So those aerosols from ships emissions um, created these small particles, which would then act as cloud condensation nuclei. So low level marine clouds were abundant uh, when these aerosols were around. Removing those aerosols you remove a lot of those low level clouds, so you get incredibly increased warming over the oceans. And that's what we're seeing. So let's look at sea surface temperatures over the ocean, aligned up on the same uh, time scale. And you can see this is the Northern Hemisphere mid latitude. So the band between the two red lines here, and you can see the sea surface temperature has been increasing significantly um, over the last, from 2000. Um, you can see the, you know, the blue, the, <coughs> you can see the, the anomalies um, are relative to 1951 to 2000, a fairly recent baseline. And you can see the rise of temperatures um, of the, nor the oceans in this region. Um, this is the Southern Hemisphere, mid-latitude region. You know, the oceans here are also warming, not quite as much as the in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a lot more water down there, right? It's a lot more coverage. And then if you take the global oceans, you can see the sea surface temperature rising. And you can see the spike here in the last few years. You know, a huge spike in the warming, uh, but everything is warming at much accelerated rates because of the reduction of the aerosols, um, mostly the huge reductions from shipping but also reductions over land. Okay, so this is a key image. Um, I've got some other images I may as well show you. Um, th this, is, um, this is a Paris limit watch for 1.5 Celsius. So this is this year. These are um, relative to the 1850 to 1900 pre-industrial in quotes baseline. And you can see that since about, um, since from July on this year, we've been above 1.5 essentially. 1.52, 1.5. We blew it away in September, October high, blew it away in November, and it's just gone crazy the first week of December. So we'll see where this ends up, but right now the year to date average is looking like 1.46. Um, could, you know, if this, we don't have, we only have a few weeks left, so we'll see. We'll probably not break. 1.5 it turns out but this year but add a few months of next year with the additional warming and you know we're going to be over have a whole year over 1.5 and we're going to go up much much higher than 1.5 in fact some days um this early this month and last month we were over two degrees we hit 2.06 on this scale just for individual days okay so we're blowing past 1.5 and we're, we're, we're only going to see it in the rearview mirror and we're rapidly approaching to. Um, this is a good image I came across. This is from 1970 to present day and it's all of the months and it's the average monthly temperatures. And you can see, you know, we were breaking uh, 1.5 for months at a time um, in, uh, you know, 2019. That was March of 2019, 1.5, 1.6, then beginning of the year um, in 2020. Um, there's
there's another 1.5 broken, 1.5 broken, and look at this year here. We've got um, this is this is this year. You know, we're, we're almost 1.8 in November. December is even warmer than November. You know, we're we're very very close to the 1.5. So this is a good another way to depict um, to depict it. Um, this is Ottawa. You know what it's been like recently. I mean, eight degrees. <laughs> I have one, I have eight degrees, three degrees, five, it's supposed to be nine degrees. <coughs> All of these temperatures well above freezing, just completely, um, completely uh, crazy, breaking records, etc. cetera. Um, I've got some jokes here. Um, specialists, here's what you, people like shuffling things around. Take all the individual subjects, combine them into one institute of innovation. Genius, amazing, creative. And then a year later, okay, take the um, institute of innovation and split it into specialist subjects. <laughs> Go back to where you were a year earlier. Genius, amazing, so creative. People just like messing around with this sort of change. Um, next time a conspiracy theorist tries to tell you what really happened, present a more outlandish theory and accuse them of covering up the truth. The moon landing is fake. Pfft, you believe in the moon, <laughs> right? This is a good thing to try, maybe. Um, there was a couple other things I wanted, you know, in here. Um, yes, the end is near. This will never end. So these two signs in conflict, you know, the end is near being a bad thing. This will never end also being a bad thing. And this guy's saying your optimism <laughs> disgusts me. There's a, I posted this cartoon a while ago. The, the end is Thursday is this guy is saying, and you know, the end is near this guy is saying, and he's thinking amateur, right? The end is near, but how can he possibly predict it's going to be on Thursday, <laughs> right? He's saying this guy's a bit just crazy and to be discounted. Um, lots of other images and stuff. There's a couple others I wanted to show you. This is interesting. China's high-speed rail network. In 2008, 118 kilometers, right? And in 2023, 15 years ago, 42,000 kilometers. Look how quickly they can develop things there and all the emissions from that. It's just phenomenal. Okay, well, anyway, um, and on Twitter, um, there's some interesting stuff. This this came up recently. This shows temperature from 1940 to 2023, global monthly temperatures. And the wheel is January to December. And you can see what's happening here. You know, the incredible warming that's been accelerating. I mean, war warming's definitely been accelerating. Look how quickly it's, it's increasing. So this is James Hansen's website. You know, Google James Hansen, Columbia. And you can see his website, and he's posted this article, Global Warming Acceleration, El Nino Measuring Stick Looks Good, and there's a link to it from December 14th, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So some of this is review. I mean, we talked about this in videos, and when I had an interview, when I interviewed James Hansen one-on-one -on -one for 45 minutes, that's uh, posted under the Climate Emergency Forum um, website. You can just Google Climate Emergency Forum. Uh, Hansen, and you can find the, the video. So <laughs> I've already talked about this curve again. So global warming is accelerating because the drive or driving force for warming is the Earth's energy imbalance. It's doubled in the past decade. The measurement of the acceleration is hampered by the unforced tropical El Nino La Nina variability, but a good measuring stick is to look at the warming between successive large El Ninos. So strengthening of the current 2023 to 2024 El Nino has raised it to a level similar to the 1997 to 98 and 2015 to 2016 El Ninos. Um, even though these earlier ones were stronger, because of the background warming is, you know, the, the total warming is the warming, the trend, right, plus the, the variability from the actual El Nino. And the trend is increasing so quickly 
that even an El Nino that's not super strong, although this one is now super strong, the current one, it appears to be um, stronger than the previous strong El Nino. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So the first six months of the current El Nino are 0 0.39 Celsius warmer than the same six months of the 2015 to 16 El Nino. So we're only, you know, that's only basically uh, eight years difference. If you extend that to a full 10 years, it's about 0.49 Celsius per decade, which is much higher than even this slope. So the last decades being the temperatures gone up higher than that slope. There's definitely a large acceleration. We expect the 12 month mean temperature by May, 2024 to eliminate any doubt about global warming acceleration. Subsequent decline of the 12 month temperature below 1.5 will likely be limited, confirming that the 1.5 limits already been passed. So there was some objection to Hansen's arguments um, by mainstream scientists who I won't mention their names, um, but Hansen is the, is the real man. Let me just leave it at that. Um, and uh, we don't have to wait long to see uh, this, ex you know, this acceleration is happening so fast, you know, it'll all be clear. The mainstream scientists will have to be eating their words, apologizing profu profusely, although they won't, they'll say, oh, we were saying this all along, you know, it's all nonsense. Okay, but uh, anyway, I, I'll, I always let you know the real scoop here, the real stuff, so it's, you know, I, I can predict that the mainstream scientists that are saying there's no acceleration adamantly right now will be eating, their, they'll, they'll be fudging and hedging and, and they, they'll never apologize. They'll never say that they're wrong, which is, which is a huge problem for, for, for them to be credible uh, scientists. You know, people not able to admit that they're wrong. I don't have much respect for those people. Okay, so... Um, I'll just, uh, basically, global temperatures increased 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade since 1970. Temperature prior to the current El Nino is about 1.2 above pre-industrial, where we define, now Hansen defines pre-industrial to be mostly 1880 to 1920. That average, um, you know, a lot of uh, previous work is showing 1850 to 1900. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, the goal of the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, which runs the uh, climate conferences, including COP28, which I've talked a lot about, and the Paris Agreement is for the rate of warming to slow down so the global warming stabilizes at 1.5 or less. But we're accelerating. We have been since 2010. Because the Earth's energy imbalance has gotten huge, and that's the immediate driver for global temperature change. So we project an acceleration of the post-2020 warming rate by 50 to 100 percent. That's the yellow area in figure one. Global temperature is now accelerating past 1.5. It, it's like it could reach, it, I think it will reach 2 degrees in the 2030s barring purposeful actions to reduce or reverse Earth's energy imbalance. So we're, we're basically 1.5. We're rapidly heading to 2. We can probably not stop 2 even. Okay, so this is a huge problem for all of the reports and NGOs and policymakers and, and COP28 because they're all arguing, you know, we still have budget for 1.5. It's just, it's just, it's crazy. It's just stupid. Now, the three-year period of strong La Niña's that we had um, hit, has hid some of the acceleration of the global warming. It's been occurring, but it's been hidden by this large natural variability. More and more energy going into the oceans, less was going into the air during these La Niña's, so it looked like, uh, you know, things were not too bad. Now we're out of this La Niña phase, things are awful. So, so if you take the Niño 3.4, uh, and this is a region in the tropical Pacific. The temperature is measured there, and then when it goes above a certain level, it's it's uh, a which is 0. 0.5 degrees Celsius. Then um, you say you're in the La Nina, and if you go below minus 0. 0.5, you say you're in a, a, a uh, sorry you're in an El Nino if you go above, and you're in a La Nina if you go below. And this is uh, this is just the the raw data. 
If you take away the global warming trend, then you can detrend the anomaly and you see this. So, so if you look at this, it looks like the present El Nino is almost as strong as the previous strong ones. But if you take away the trend baseline, you see that the, the 1998 case was very, very strong. Um, the 2015, 2016 was, looked like even stronger and we're not quite there yet, but we're, it looks like we're in a super El Nino uh, situation. Okay, uh, this is a good map showing the temperature, uh, global average temperature by season during the growth and phase down of the three large El Ninos, the one that we're in now and the previous two. Okay, so if you look at 97, 98, uh, this is June, July, August, September, October, November, and so on. And you can see how it, this very, very warm water here is, is, is the, the characteristic of the El Nino. You see it strengthening here and it still, it weakens a bit, but it's still extremely strong and it starts to fade. And you can compare this, these changes to 2015, 16. Okay, you see it strengthening and you can see that this, the 97, 98 was much stronger. Okay, and this, this is, this, this is the, 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 the ongoing 2023, 2024 El Nino. Uh, you know, it's pretty strong here. It's stronger than this one, not as strong as uh, 97, 98. And here's where we are now. Um, so it's not as strong as these guys, but it's approaching, it's getting stronger. Interestingly, look at the um, warming over South America. You see, you don't see it here right? It's ocean warming. You see a bit of it in 2015-16 over the rainforests, you know, parts of South America, also, you know, some parts of Af Southern Africa. But look here, look at the warming here in South, and look at the warming here. I mean, what's different this year is that we're missing so much sea ice in Antarctica that that's adding a huge component of extra warming to the waters down here. Right. I mean, look at the warming of, of, of uh, Antarctica, you know, in these previous ones. I mean, we're way higher now um, and we're getting warming of, over continents in the southern hemisphere. OK, so it's quite different. But anyway, this shows you that, you know, this El Nino is strong. You know, it looks like it's a strong temperatures are, are reaching the temperatures that we reached in previous El Ninos. But that's because the, we have to th look at the El Nino plus the, the, the baseline of global warming going up or the trend of going up of global warming. And when we take away that trend and just look at the power of the El Ninos itself, you can see that the, the uh, 97, 98 one was so much, much, I mean, it looks like the 2015 and uh, 2016 compared to the 97, 98, it looks like they're comparable. Right, but when you look, and they're much bigger than this year so far. But what you, what you look when you look at the maps, you can see that the big one of the century was the ninety seven ninety eight uh, situation. So this is the surface temperature anomaly just in the Nino three point four region, which runs from minus one twenty to minus one seventy um, longitude, and it runs from the equator within plus or minus uh, you know it's within about this this band is about five degrees i believe um and you can see the temperatures the 97 98 just blew away uh you know the 2015 2016 and this year's and you can see this is september october november december january february you can see um what we're what we're what we had um, in, in, in uh, the previous two El Ninos. I mean, this one, you know, is starting to get stronger. It might be comparable to this, but probably it's not as big as these, these guys. Okay, and it looks like the 2015, 2016 one was stronger here, but when you look at the patterns here, you know, it looks like, like I said, the 97, 98 one was stronger. So if we compare the, um, like I said, uh, in the, at the beginning, comparing the temperature rise um, in the first six months of this El Nino to the last one, we're 0.39 degrees Celsius warmer. Um, and if you put that on a decadal scale, that's 0.49 degrees Celsius per decade, which is way higher 
than the ex even than the accelerated warming that we expect. So the El Ninos are a good kind of yardstick, as Hansen is saying. Um, the acceleration, um, you know, the warming this year is just phenomenal. The warming in September was gobsmackingly bananas, is uh, the best way you can scientifically describe it. Um, and, you know, the decadal rate from 1970 to 2010 was 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade, you know, um, and in the last since the last El Nino, we we're hitting, we've hit 0.49, which is way, way above this, and even way before the um, the yellow zones in this curve. And I, I'm repeating this because I'm emphasizing this over and over because you can't say this often enough. The policymakers, governments, the world needs to recognize this because anytime they talk about keeping to 20, you know, to 1.5 degrees, it's basically it's basically bullshit. They're, they're sending you a pack of lies. They don't know the latest science. So this latest science really has to get out there. And this is really good. This says it all. This it looks at 2023 versus the other El Nino origin years. Okay, the year the El Nino started. So that the blue curve is 97. This is 2015. This is 2023. And you can see the you know, the, 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 the curves are much higher and that's from the global warming that's occurring between those El Ninos. Look what's going on here. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like this is September, October, November. You know, we'll have December and the full year data soon. This curve is heading way up here. We're gonna have entire months over two degrees Celsius. And, you know, we could, where we, where's this curve gonna end up? Well, look at this curve. I mean, maybe we'll peak here and come down well this is this is over two degrees right and come down a little bit and i doubt we'll go back down you know this is this peaked at 1.6 and went down to 1.1 or something um so you know if we're, we peak over two i doubt we're, we may not even ever go back to 1.5 we might be kissing 1.5 goodbye forever okay if you look at this data so the next six months is going to be pretty phenomenal um, this is showing the winds of the current El Nino over time. This is zonal wind. It should say, should be west to east, okay, and the text is correct. And you can see that there's been a strengthening. Um, this is a strengthening of the winds, the reddish and oranges and yellow. You know, so it's strengthening. It's blowing more and more warm water at the surface over to that um, Nino 3.4 region. Okay, so the El Nino is... This burst of westerly winds in November, there was a strong burst of westerly winds, you know, that you can see in this, um, in this depiction here. Um, this is winds in the U direction, going from west to east, between five north and five south. Um, and this is a 850 hexapascal, so it's about, you know, a kilometer, a kilometer and a half above the surface. The pressure at sea level is about a thousand. 850 is about 1.5 kilometers up. So it's the winds that are pushing that water across, strengthening the El Nino. So this strong burst of westerly winds, westerly winds are winds from the west to the east. It's propagated across the Pacific. It's pushed these warm waters of the, off the, of the west towards South America, strengthening the El Nino. The Nino 3.4 index has risen to two degrees Celsius. The strength of the current El Nino um, is predicted by most models to be comparable to the 2015 to 16 El Nino. So we can use global temperature during these El Ninos because they're, you know, comparable strength as a measuring stick for um, looking at global warming acceleration. And we can see uh, the acceleration happening. Okay. Um, and uh, there is a review paper on ENSO forecasting skill. I'm not going to go into that paper. I'll just show it to you. Um, it's open source. You, you can click on that link and download it, you know, real time. And so forecast skill is evaluated over the last two decades with a focus on the onset of the ENSO, ENSO events. Excuse me. I'm just going to talk about the, you know, what it, what it's conclusion, concluding. So it looks at the ENSO, calls it like a predictions plume, you know, a whole bunch of different curves uh, with different models. Um, those are different forecasts, real-time forecasts of the Nino, Nino 
3.4 index. Um, it's looked at it over the last 10 years, and it's found, well, no surprise there, but the forecast skill diminishes when you have more lead time in both the dynamical and statistical forecast models. The peak accuracy occurs post-Northern Hemisphere spring, predictably uh, the barrier and preceding season. So um, basically it's saying that, you know, as we, you know, once we, um, <coughs> the peak accuracy occurs um, after, after the spring. So, you know, in the summer, in the winter. So the accuracy of forecasting for this El Nino should be pretty high. The dynamic forecasts outperform the statistical forecasts. There's a pronounced advantage in the forecasts initiated from the late boreal winter through spring. Okay, so the forecasting should be pretty accurate on the exist on what this El Nino will do, and it's forecasting to be a strong El Nino. This paper basically shows that these forecasts should be pretty good at this stage. Okay, so basically. In conclusion, if we go back to this um, and to um, the Leon Simmons post, you don't want to miss his posts. I mean, this is this is fantastic talking about the different sulfur levels and how the temperature of the oceans are responding. I mean, the oceans are warming like crazy. We've got less sulfur coming from the ships and industry on land, especially from ships. It's been sliced, we dropped off a cliff for sulfur emissions from ships. And this is, um, this is a bit, I mean, it's good to lower aerosols because they lead in a lot of air pollution deaths, but if we cut it off like this over the oceans, you know, it's causing us trouble. And if in a couple of years when warming spikes and people realize this, they may actually put some back in the, the sh in the ships and phase it out more slowly, not just have a step function drop, right? As warming continues to spike further and further. So anyway, um, make sure you follow James Hansen, check out his Columbia uh, website uh, frequently. And, you know, if you haven't read or are familiar with his previous posts, it's well worth going back and, and uh, you know, reading them. And his most latest post from a couple of days ago um, is very, very important, and it shows clearly how we can use the El Nino, the strong El Ninos that have been occurring as measuring sticks to see how much the warming is per decade, and it's not looking good. The reduction of sulfur aerosols has increased, you know, our, our, our warming rate has increased by 50 to 100 percent um, from 2010, and it looks like you know, from 2015 to present, the increase is actually more like following a decadal increase of 0 0.49 degrees Celsius per decade, because the temperatures now in 2023-24, the first six months of the El Nino, are actually 0 0.39 degrees Celsius warmer than the same six months in the 2015-2016 El Nino, and this was only eight years ago. So warming is accelerating like a bat out of hell, basically. So please, uh, thanks for listening. Make sure you go to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and donate on my PayPal to support my um, research and videos as I try to figure out and you know what's going on. Join the dots of abrupt climate system mayhem. You know, see what's going on in the near term, what we can expect in the near term, what we can expect in the farther term. And uh, hold on to your hats because we're going to blow apart all records, it looks like, in the next six months. And it's going to be very difficult for anybody to deny this huge acceleration of warming. So then, you know, mainstream scientists will start waking up and say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, let's, we better look at this sulfur. I mean, the data is all here, but they don't know they don't know they don't follow it it's not in their specialty of research so they're they're uh you know you're not getting cutting edge science from 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 those those guys basically um i doubt this was even mentioned or talked about in the present agu conference i'll be doing lots of papers that result from the 
AGU conference, the American Geophysical Union conference that's been going on all this week. It overlapped. Of course, the COP28 ended just a few days ago with, uh, you know, a nothing burger, if you like, the promise to transition away from fossil fuel. You know, if you, uh, you say you're hooked on donuts and, uh, you know, you go to the doctor, you're having problems, doctor says you have diabetes, doctor doesn't say, well, you better transition off donuts, right? <laughs> Instead of having two boxes a day, you know, go down to, you know, one donut less a day and then drop it another one. Uh, the doctor doesn't say that, you know, transition off donuts. You know, you, you get uh, breathing, respiratory problems, you're a heavy smoker, you go to the doctor, doctor says you have lung cancer. That's what my father passed away from um, at the age of 59 from lung cancer. He was always a heavy smoker, right? But the doctor isn't going to say, well, we've got to transition you off smoking, right? I mean, transitioning off something is maybe easier in some cases. Like if you're addicted to, to uh, heavy drugs, uh, you know, the doctor doesn't just um, cut them off generally because that can make it worse for you. Right, you can transition off them. So there's some things you need to transition off of, but other things you just go cold turkey, right? So anyway, you know the 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 you know it took 28 cops for them to even talk about fossil fuels and and the idea of transitioning off them. So I guess we you know we can look for 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 glimmers of hope that you know policymakers will do something eventually, but they're just they're just glimmers and they're usually dashed all the time. So. Um, but anyway, you know, one of the big papers or reports that came out of the AGU conference is um, the Arctic Report Card. So I'll do a video definitely in the next few days on the Arctic Report Card. And I still need to cover this, 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 this video on, uh, if I can find it, there's a report here. You can maybe read it or look at it in advance of my video on it. If you want to get a head start, it's 494 pages long. It's called Global Tipping Points, a report from 2023, University of Exeter. And it was introduced at the COP conference. Um, and I, I'll do a video or several videos on this because this is a very important topic and it's one of my favorite sort of topics. I mean, you know, I love anything to do with the Arctic, anything to do with abrupt climate change, i.e. global tipping points, etc. Um, is my, you know, it's my cup of tea. It's my sort of biggest area of expertise, uh, most interested in it. So I'll be doing, you know, videos on that um, very, very soon um, as well, plus anything else that, that comes up. So have a read of Hansen's latest letter. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's very, very strong evidence that the warming, you know, what we're going to see moving forward you know, it's just is incredibly rapid, abrupt climate system change, which is, uh, you know, which policymakers and politicians and just about anybody not watching my videos uh, is going to be taken by surprise. We never expected this. People never told us this. It's happening faster than normal. Well, at least you guys are in the know, you know, what to do with that knowledge. You know, it was another question, but at least you you have that knowledge. So thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Encourage um, other people, your friends, other people to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to, you know, follow my videos and work. And uh, also, thanks very much for everybody that's donated for my research and videos. And, uh, you know, it keeps me independent. It's my it's my only source of income, really, and it keeps me uh, independent. Uh, you know, I can do, I, you know, I can say whatever I see happening without any um, concern of, you know, getting funding cut or sent out onto the street because you say something that, you know, upsets somebody that is funding you. I mean, that doesn't enter with me. I'm completely independent of any of that nonsense. Okay, well, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll chat soon. Bye for now.